You join me here at Belfast at the interface where most of the trouble this week actually did take place. We had a bus being burnt in another part of the city. But it's here. Security was very high and very tight last night to try and keep both sides apart. The trouble started here over an, an anti-Northern Ireland protocol rally. And strange enough, there was two arrests, both juveniles and both from the nationalist community on the far side, we believe. Uh, and we also believe that they weren't even from Belfast. So it, it says a lot of where this is all going. Unionists despise the protocol. Not one part of unionism actually agrees with it. And I caught up with a unionist activist to find out exactly what his thoughts were. For over two decades, our community has been told that uh, post the Belfast Agreement, Northern Ireland's political institutions are meant to be based upon the, the premise of cross-community consent. This protocol doesn't have the consent of a solitary unionist elected representative at any level, uh, from council to the House of Lords uh, uh, within Northern Ireland. So uh, there's a massive campaign going on against that politically. There has been a protest campaign uh, going on against that. And unfortunately, sometimes the anger and frustrations have boiled over into the streets uh, and into to violence. Violence, which nobody wants to see, but but there is a problem here because many people within the unionist and loyalist community and, and legitimately would see uh, that the belief that the threat of nationalist violence. I mean, we, we remember Leo Varadkar went to the EU and waved about newspaper articles about IRA bombs. We remember the SDLP talked about civil disobedience at a minimum if there was to be so much as CCTV on the border. And unionists and loyalists believe that this threat of nationalist violence or nationalist civil disobedience was rewarded by putting a border in the Irish Sea. So unfortunately, when you set that precedent, many people in unionist and loyalist communities look at it in a very serious way and say, well, I mean, if a threat of violence was good enough to prevent a land border, why shouldn't the same tactic be good enough to prevent a sea border? And I, I don't, I'm, I'm not advocating that, but I make the point to say it's a very logical conclusion to come to and it's a very difficult conclusion to, to argue against because it does seem to be strongly based on, on fact and logic. Well... People here, you, you heard that, they're, they're saying if the threat of violence is good enough for one side, well, it probably will be for the other. And these communities, these unionist communities in here, have a lot in common with communities in the north of England. They believe that they're being made to apologise for their culture. They believe their culture is being taken away from them, that other cultures are coming over the top of them, and they feel isolated where they are. They feel that they are political capital, and they are being spent very foolishly. Now, the leader of unionism in Northern Ireland is Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. He has the ear of Lord Frost, I suppose, in a lot of those talks, and he has appealed for calm in Northern Ireland and says that politics is actually working. Well, I'm very concerned that yet again we see young people out on our streets, some of them who may end up with a, a criminal record for, because of this violence, and it achieves absolutely nothing. And I would simply appeal either to the young people or who, to those who are encouraging them to come out onto the streets. This is not the way forward. Politics is how we're going to resolve these issues around the protocol. We're making progress. Uh, we didn't have violence over the summer, and thus when we made the progress... Uh, and so please, this violence has to stop. You're only harming your own community. You're harming the image of Northern Ireland. You're doing damage to the place you profess to love. Stop the violence, stay off the streets, let the politicians do the job they were elected to do. And I believe we won't have to wait long before we see decisive action taken on the protocol. But it will be as a result of political pressure, not violence. Well, political, political pressure, Jeffrey Donaldson says, and you can almost see that, that he's nearly suggesting something is coming down the line. Now, Miho Martin, when questioned about the, the rumours that Article 16 was going to be triggered by Lord Frost, was very animated. Uh, journalist here saying that he was very... Um, forthright and, and he was going to see no such thing but if you actually look at the body language of Miho Martin he seems to be quite scared about it he, he realises that if the protocol is uh, triggered that he heads up a, a very rocky coalition government in the south and Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, is the largest party in the Republic of Ireland and that may trigger an election in the south. Now the Sinn Féin has the political capital, it has it in bundles and oozles, and unfortunately for them, 
if they were caught, if the protocol, if the Article 16 was triggered here and, and anybody in, in and around Sinn Féin or the old IRA, if you like, were even caught on street protests, that, that political capital would shrink and shrink and shrink and it may affect their voting power in the South. So everything to play for here as we go into the weekend with those uh, very, very important talks coming up.